we are visiting with fur bear biologist Steph Tucker on how we manage fur bear populations through necropsies. I'm Mike Anderson with the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Steph, what are necropsies? Sure. Necropsies are really just an autopsy on an animal instead of a human. And we do necropsies for a variety of reasons in North Dakota. Some is to determine animal health or cause of death. But the necropsies I do for fur bearers usually serve a different purpose. So we're just using that necropsy to collect some very basic demographic and reproductive information about the animals so that we can survey them with that information. And so um, mountain lions, bobcats, river otters, and fishers are four of the species of fur bears in North Dakota that we require hunters and trappers to relinquish the carcass to us after the pelt has been removed. Steph, many fur bears can't be monitored through aerial surveys, ground surveys, just surveys in general. Is that why we're doing necropsies? Absolutely right, Mike. So things like mountain lions, you know, they're, they're really low densities on the landscape. They have huge home ranges. They're nocturnal. They're very secretive, even when they're moving about during the day. And so we can't drive around and count them or even get up in an airplane and count them. We would never see them or find them. So we have to come up with other ways to survey the populations and monitor those population trends. And that is especially important if we have an open hunting or trapping season on that animal. Uh, we need some way to monitor those populations and ensure that our hunting and trapping seasons are either having the impact or not having the impact, uh, depending on what our population management goals are for that species. What are population models? Population model is just a statistical estimate of the population abundance or trend. In this case, mostly trends. So we're trying to determine is the population increasing or decreasing? And we figure that out through information on survival and reproduction from these animals that we collect. And we're collecting them again. Um, those hunters and trappers are really vital in helping us collect enough carcasses to create those population models to monitor the trends. And that's how we set limits and for fur bears. Absolutely. So say we want a population that is stable, to maintain stable the number of animals we have on the landscape right now. That's, that's what we're after. And our population trend is really increasing. So we might open up that hunting or trapping season a little bit more. We might allow more few, more animals to be taken the following year, or vice versa. If the population is trending downward and we don't want it to trend downward, we might back off on our hunting or trapping seasons a little bit to account for that. Uh, what type of information are you gathering from these carcasses? Right, so for my purposes when creating a population model, there's really two important pieces of information. We wanna know how old the animal is when it died so that we can estimate survival based on that age information. And the second thing is we wanna find out if it is a female, was she reproductively active in the last year? And if so, how big was that litter that she might have had? Um, how do you age these animals? Some people know that most mammals, actually all mammals, have growth rings on the roots of their teeth. So think back to when you cut a tree down and you look at it when it's opened up and you can count the growth rings. How many, you know, it grows at different rates during different times of year and it leaves these really obvious rings on that tree. Same thing happens to the teeth of mammals, including us and all of the fur bears we're, at, we're talking about today. Um, and so what we do is we pull a standardized tooth. So it's one of the teeth gets extracted from the animal. And then we use a lab over in Montana called Matson's Lab. They will section that tooth and they'll stain it so those growth rings really pop out under a microscope and they're gonna count the growth rings for us to give us a really accurate age. And so that's how we estimate how old the animal is from at the time of its death. So what, what are you measuring like a mountain lion? What are you looking for? So we wanna know in general what the size of, and weight of mountain lions are in North Dakota because that's useful to managers both in North Dakota and other regions. Are we bigger, are we smaller? It helps us age the animal a little bit as well. We're gonna look at the teeth, we're gonna estimate the age, but again, we're gonna pull a tooth to get you know, a better idea of the age. But measurement just gives us that database to, to base you know, basic population information about mountain lions on in North Dakota. 
Steph, I know you mentioned earlier, what species again, what fur bear species do you do this? Right, so we have uh, four species of fur bears. This is our primary monitoring method for, including mountain lions, bobcats, fishers, and river otters. And so you also notice those are the four species that if you're a hunter or trapper, you are actually required to relinquish the carcass to us after you remove the pelt. So if you catch one, uh, you take the pelt off, that's usually the most valuable thing. And then you're, in, in, you're supposed to give us the, the entire carcass, including the head afterwards. We facilitate that exchange through our pelt tagging program. In order to legally possess that pelt, you have to have a tag for that pelt. And we give you that tag when you give us the carcass. So we kind of facilitate this exchange through our tagging program, and we require pelt tags for those four species. Um, two of the species, fishers and mountain lions, those pelt tags are actually administered through our agency. Uh, for river otters and bobcats, those those two species actually have oversight by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because they look similar to some endangered species like Canada lynx and sea otters. And so our pelt tagging program, while we are delivering the pelt tags and handing them out and distributing them, there's oversight there also from the federal government on where those pelt tags go and how many we're administering every year. You guys open these animals up. What type of information are you gathering when you do that? Right, like I said, our most important information for my purposes for serving the populations is that age and reproductive information. But we do, because we have the animals in hand, we are able to collect a lot of other really useful information, such as diet. We'll look at see what the animal was eating. Uh, we get information on how big the animals are, the difference in size between males and females. Um, we'll also get overall animal health. So was the animal healthy when it died? We might do some disease surveillance for, you know, either, either diseases that can have an impact negatively on the population or have the ability to tr be transmitted to people. So we'll do some disease surveillance if that's a priority at that time as well. Give me some examples. I mean, you got a mountain lion right behind you, mm -hmm. you know, in their natural habitat. What type of things would they be, say, eating or what type of habitats are they using? Right. How do you gather that information from this? So there's a few things. We're gonna look you know, at the, externally at the animal. So one thing that mountain lions like to eat is porcupines. And sometimes we might see porcupine quills in their face, front shoulders, or chest areas like that. But we're also gonna open up, and we're gonna open up the stomach cavity. And we're gonna look to see what's in there. Now mountain lions primarily eat deer. And so that's typically what we find and what we expect to find in a mountain lion. But sometimes we find other unusual things like a porcupine, for example, or a beaver, or a wild turkey, things like that that they might encounter because they are opportunistic. Um, and each species is a little bit different. Say if this was a bobcat, bobcats are rabbit specialists. So we find primarily rabbit, remains of rabbits in their stomachs and things like that. In years of low rabbit numbers on the landscape, we'll find a lot of voles and mice in a bobcat stomach. And so it just kind of depends on what's going on there at that time in North Dakota with the predator-prey cycle. Um, but some, a lot of species are pretty predictable in what we're probably going to find in their stomach. So gathering all this information is very important to managing these species. It is. This is our critical survey method for these species of fur bearers. And without these animals to necropsy, we would have no other information to, to adjust our management up or down depending on what's going on in the population because we just wouldn't know. So this is our primary survey method for these species. A lot of great information, Steph. Thank you. You're welcome.